Good afternoon and welcome to the annual Radcliffe Day Luncheon. Welcome alumni, alumni, fellows, colleagues, and friends. There are many people, many connections, and many accomplishments to celebrate today. Thank you for being with us. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to this year's Radcliffe medalist, Ila Bott. I want to begin by recognizing our most senior alumni, starting with two graduates here today celebrating their 75th reunion. Rose Downs Arnold and Ruth Paddock, class of 1936, and I'd also like to recognize Winifred Campbell from the class of 1939. Welcome. <laughs> I'd like to extend a very special welcome as well to alumni celebrating their 50th Radcliffe Ra Re College reunion, the class of 1961. Generations of women and men have benefited enormously from your courage in challenging expectations and creating new options. We celebrate you. We also have a special guest from the 10th reunion class, Dr. Hema Mugai, who was awarded the Jane Rainey Opal Young Alumna Award earlier today for her work on equality in global health and her commitment to community-based research and activism. This award, named for Jane Rainey Opal, class of 1950, a former executive director of the Radcliffe College Alumni Association, is given by the Radcliffe Shared Interest Group of the, Ra of the Harvard Co Alumni Association and the Harvard Women's Center. Congratulations to Dr. Mugai, and welcome to our guest, from the Alumni Association, the Radcliffe Shared Interest Group, and the Winman Center, special welcomes to Bob Bowie and Mary Carty. Welcome. I would also like to recognize the past presidents and executive directors of the Radcliffe College Alumni Association who are with us today. Please join me in thanking them for their service. <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank Swanee Hunt, our moderator this morning, and the panelists Abigail English, Lonnie Guineer, and Nancy Hill for a fascinating and motivating panel. I'll report now briefly on the state of the Institute. As you will hear, this academic year has given us much to celebrate. Our three core programs are robust and thriving. The fellowship program continues to be the broadest of any in the world as it brings together humanists, social scientists, members of the professions, and creative artists. With an acceptance rate of only 6%, it is as selective as Harvard College. We have several tables of fellows here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Radcliffe's newest alumni. The Schlesinger Library remains the premier repository of collections on the history of women in the United States. It is also at the forefront of digital collecting, and it has taken the lead in looking to the future, convening just a few weeks ago 
archivists, librarians, computer scientists, and technologists to consider new ways technology can enhance access by making collections available sooner and more widely. Academic Ventures has soared in the past year. From a few unrelated seminars and public events, the Institute has built a cohesive, vibrant programming program, increasing not only the number of activities, but also their scope and relevance to each other. This year's conference on gender in the developing world included arts performances and an associated technology exhibit including technology developed by Harvard undergraduates. Through faculty design meetings on subjects as diverse as cybersecurity, climate change, prevention of school violence, and the history and future of the book, Ventures has gained attention across the university as a neutral space to germinate research that is promising, high risk, multidisciplinary, and potentially transforming. These three core programs and their synergies distinguish the Radcliffe Institute from other institutes for advanced study as this pushes forward the frontiers of knowledge in all fields, bringing together people in unique and often surprising combinations and truly engaging with the greater university of which it is a part. Through its programs, the Institute is redesigning intellectual life in the 21st century providing academic common space, a haven for speculative thought, and a range of activities that allow Harvard students at all levels to meet and engage with leaders in their fields from around the world. I hope you share my excitement for the excellence and potential these, uh, these programs offer to advancing scholarship. Organizationally and financially, the Institute is now better poised for growth. We have energetic new leadership and additional staff in several key areas. Most visible, as I hope you have witnessed, are more extensive communications, including an exciting new social media presence. The budget restructuring we undertook in the economic downturn has left the Institute again with a strong financial foundation. We were able to provide the university with a five-year budget that is balanced while allowing modest growth in our programs and renewed capital investments. Most notably, next year's fellowship class will return to a full complement of fellows. The library's maximum access project is continuing apace. We have been able to increase the level of faculty leadership in academic ventures, and starting next week, we will begin renovating Fay House. I am delighted to report that giving has begun to rebound as well, with contributions significantly increased over last year. We are truly grateful for the support from you, Radcliffe College alumni. Thank you for all you do to further the Institute's mission. This year, we also took a serious, in-depth look at the Institute's future, completing a comprehensive strategic planning process. Faculty, fellows, staff, Friends and supporters of the Institute collaborated in designing a long-range plan that embodies a vision for the Institute's second decade and provides a framework for realizing that vibrant future. I'm very pleased to let you know that this spring we received a very generous gift from Sid Knoffel, a dedicated university citizen, affirming his support of the vision of the long-range plan and the role it lays out for the Institute to play within the university and academia at large. We are grateful for his wonderful gift and endorsement, and I hope you have some goodly measure of his and my enthusiasm for the vision outlined in this plan. Its goals are ambitious and vital to the future success of Radcliffe Institute. They can only be realized with your continued support. 
Though Radcliffe Day is always a special occasion, this one is particularly personally poignant because it is my last as Dean of the Institute. I came to Radcliffe initially as Dean of Science, intending to serve for five years and focused on building a science program. I have stayed for 10, allured most recently by the challenge of in challenges of integrating the Institute's programs into a coherent one Radcliffe and establishing its presence more robustly and broadly within Harvard. It has been an honor and a privilege to lead the Institute. I am grateful to President Faust for this opportunity and to all of you for your belief in Radcliffe's importance and for your commitment to its growth and evolution. My special thanks to members of the Dean's Advisory Council and the Schlesinger Library Council for being generous with their time, energy, and advice. Your guidance has been invaluable. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me now in welcoming to the stage for a few remarks a notable historian, Radcliffe Institute's founding dean, and Harvard's president, Drew Gilpin Faust. It's such a pleasure for me to be up on this stage again on Radcliffe Day, looking out over the wonderful representation of Radcliffe's uh, history past, present, and its future, and so many supporters of the Institute, both alumni and others across the Harvard family. I wanted the stage today to say a few words about Barbara. Uh, she has, I think, described so well the strength of the Institute and the position that she has brought it to. And I want to focus on just a couple of the parts of this remarkable institution that she has made such sterling contributions to advancing and enhancing during what she has described as her decade of service at Radcliffe. Indeed, so much of what she has done as dean grew out of the kinds of achievements that she initiated at the Institute in her early years as Dean of Science. Because um, she and I remember when the Institute was just formed and I was coming and I began talking to her about it, how so many people said to us, you can't have science at the Radcliffe Institute, that'll never work. And we said, how can we have a Radcliffe Institute without science? And that became Barbara's mission for the first phase of her involvement with the Radcliffe Institute. And she has not only figured out how to have science here and how to make it strong, but she's made it an absolute core part of this institution in ways that have been imaginative and innovative and now are essential to the Radcliffe Institute's identity. But that was just the beginning because Barbara uh, I think embraced so fully during those early years the potential of the kinds of interactions that the Radcliffe experiment then or the Radcliffe um, uh, Institute's uh, origins promised that she saw the ways in which further integration of fields and further integration with the university could make the Radcliffe Institute even stronger and make Harvard even stronger. 
I remember one day we were over in Cronkite, which is now the admissions office, so that dates how long ago it was, and we were listening to a Radcliffe Fellow talk about her book. And it was just a spellbinding presentation by a young writer. And Barbara turned to me and she said, thank you so much for bringing me here. I didn't really think I brought her. I think she charged forward and came and seized the opportunity. So I would give her more agency than that. But she said, thank you. I just love being in a place where there's so many fields going on at once and reaching beyond the part of Harvard that she had been located in for many years in order to understand the greater whole and what could come from it and of it. And so her uh, contributions to the academic ventures uh, dimension of Radcliffe, the name itself, which I think is so well chosen to show the forward-looking nature of what she and others have envisioned, has been such an important part of her deanship. And so as you think about all the strengths of Radcliffe that she described, and you know, paying attention to the budget during the downturn took no small part of her attention, but at the same time, she was able to build on this vision of how Radcliffe could be integrated with Harvard and com uh, com uh, contribute to Harvard so much more fully through programs like Academic Ventures. So those are two of, I think, her lasting achievements and most notable achievements among a much greater array of other contributions. So please join me once again in thanking Barbara Gross. <laughs> It's also my privilege today to introduce the interim dean of the Radcliffe Institute, Elizabeth Cohen, who is a distinguished scholar and university citizen, and also a former Radcliffe Fellow. She wrote her most recent book as a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute, so she understands very well the opportunities inherent in the fellowship program. And uh, she made many connections with other fellows and sitting with some of them right now. Uh, and so I think she understands the full nature of the meaning of fellowship at Radcliffe. She's also a historian who knows the Schlesinger Library and what it means and the kinds of opportunities for scholarship and understanding that are inherent in the collections and possibilities uh, for the Schlesinger Library. And so in that domain as well, she is ideally suited for this uh, new task. And she has been a consummate university citizen, serving as chair of the history department, reaching out across boundaries throughout the university in her own scholarly work. For example, she's very involved with um, the graduate school of design because of her interests in space and uh, urban um, uh, urban history. She's been a president of the Urban History Association. And she also chaired a task force called Common Spaces. She, together with Mo Moisen Mostafavi, uh, the dean of the design school. And so I think she understands very well the common spaces of the mind that Radcliffe can represent and the ways in which it can integrate uh, programs and people across Harvard in almost unique form. So I know you are going to uh, enjoy getting to know Liz, those of you who don't know her. Um, many of you do know her. And uh, I'm just thrilled that she said yes to taking on this task. She's a person who cares so deeply about scholarship and about the communities in which she lives. And I wanna bring her up here now to say just a few words to you. Elizabeth Cohen. <laughs> bigger than the history department when it gets together. <laughs> Thank you very much, Drew, uh, for your remarks and your welcome. Um, I'd like to add my own warm welcome to everyone here, and, and that includes my family, my friends, uh, the assembled Radcliffe community in all its wonderful diversity. And, and that diversity includes alumni of the college, uh, Radcliffe College, current and past fellows of the Radcliffe Institute, dedicated staff and faculty of, of the Radcliffe Institute and friends of Radcliffe. Someone who is no longer with us, uh, but who would take particular pleasure 
in seeing me stand up here today is my mother-in-law, Catherine Eaton Chapman, Radcliffe class of 1936. Yes, let's give her a hand. What a unique and impressive place Radcliffe is. I am honored and delighted to serve for the next year as Radcliffe's interim dean. As an historian, as you would guess, I have great respect for the past and how it empowers us to move into the future. In terms of Radcliffe's past, I value that for a century, Radcliffe gave women a home at this great university and made Harvard a better place. Many of you in this audience played an important part in that history. I also value Radcliffe's more recent incarnation as the Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Study, an intellectually vibrant place that I benefited from as a fellow uh, about 10 years ago and that continues to improve my life as a Harvard faculty member. For Radcliffe's amazing transformation into the most exciting institute of advanced study in the nation, I am deeply grateful to founding Dean Drew Faust uh, and to her successor, Barbara Gross. Drew established a perfect structure for the new Radcliffe, and Barbara has worked creatively and tirelessly for a decade as science dean and then as dean to build a Radcliffe that is broadly and deeply rooted in the arts, the humanities, the sciences, and the social sciences, a Radcliffe that fosters cutting edge and collaborative research through its many different venues, and a Radcliffe that honors its long-standing mission to support women by advancing their careers as scholars and creative artists, and by sponsoring work that, among other things, deepens understanding of women, gender, and society. It's been a male thing for centuries to say, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Today, as I prepare for the next year, I really feel that I do. I hope that I can count on your support as I try to ride astride the, soldier, the, sh the shoulders of the many women who have made Radcliffe what it is today. Together, we can give Radcliffe the exciting future that she deserves. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Drew, and thank you, and welcome back to Radcliffe, Liz. It is just wonderful to know the Institute will have your capable, energetic, and enthusiastic leadership in the year ahead. We gather on Radcliffe Day each year to honor the commitment of Radcliffe College to excellence, to celebrate the success of the Radcliffe Institute in advancing scholarship and innovation, and to award the Radcliffe Medal. Today, we honor Ila Bott, the 2011 Radcliffe Medalist. Bott is a pioneer of social entrepreneurship an innovator in finding solutions to problems that affect poor women, she has championed empowering those women to lead. She is the founder of India's Self-Employed Women's Association. This groundbreaking group's acronym, SEVA, means to serve in Hindi. Bhat has spent her life in service to the working poor of her country and has dedicated herself to the promotion of peace through the elimination of poverty. SEVA was founded in 1972 to organize workers in the informal sector, agricultural, construction, and domestic laborers, cigarette rollers, potters, weavers, street vendors, people who were unprotected against exploitive labor practices. SEVA now has 1.2 million members. It provides banking, health care, legal services, child care assistance, a housing trust, and an academy for educational development. Talk about program expansion. 
SEVA is distinguished for its commitment to the promotion of self-reliance for its members rather than charity, a commitment rooted in Ila Bott's convictions. Indeed, she has said, the definition of leader in SEVA is one who helps make others lead. Ila Bott is, by this definition, a leader of truly world-class proportions. In addition to SEVA, Bot has founded and led an array of microfinance organizations, and she has served as a member of the Indian Parliament and a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation. Her efforts through these organizations and others have helped to promote economic self-reliance for women throughout India and in many countries around the world. Bot has received many awards, including the George Meany Lane Kirkland Human Rights Award from the AFL-CIO, France's Légion d'Honneur, and most recently, the Ford Foundation Visionary Award. Ila Bot has been called the gentle revolutionary Confronted with long-standing, widespread problems, she reconceptualizes the issues, bringing a fresh perspective that leads to innovative solutions. She has stressed the importance of women's networks, such as the networks you share as Radcliffe alumni, in organizing and building alliances for change. She also embodies an important Radcliffe hallmark, bringing leading edge knowledge to bear on issues that affect the world around us. Please join me in welcoming again and honoring our 2011 Radcliffe medalist, Ila Bhatt. Ila Bhatt, we honor you today for your creative ideas, and entrepreneurial spirit, which have improved the lives of millions of women and their families. Your convictions and actions, which have been a guide and inspiration for all who aspire to change the world. And your dedication to integrity, economic freedom, and social justice. You have transformed our world and changed millions of people's lives. Congratulations. Uh, thank you, Dean Gross, for this honor, uh, which I am glad to accept on behalf of my sisters at SEBA. I am happy to be here today among colleagues, friends, well-wishers, sisters from Radcliffe Harvard Inst uh, Academic Community. Radcliffe has a special place in my heart. More than 40 years ago, one Renana Jhabwala, a young Radcliffe graduate with a degree in mathematics, came to Seva to work for a year. But she never left. She was our first and best introduction to Radcliffe, and since then, uh, several other Ratcliffe sisters uh, have given crucial support to our struggle. And also, it was here, 11 years ago, that Seva and Vigo had our first serious discussion on the informal economy with hardcore Harvard economists. 
Uh, I think you are already familiar with Seva, but uh, <clears throat> you know, let me mention about our work. Seva is a trade union of poor women engaged in countless different trades. These are street vendors, home-based workers, craftsmen, agriculture workers, salt farmers, rack pickers, cart pullers. They have no employer. Rather, the women have created their own employment by setting up micro-businesses using every skill, asset, and understanding of market needs to earn a living. There are millions of such self-employed workers in developing countries. They constitute the so-called uh, so informal economy or the marginal economy, even though in countries like India. These margins are wide, so wide, in fact, that they form more than three quarters of the country's entire economy. In my experience, margins are fertile ground. Edges are dynamic areas where there is room for growth and more fresh air to think clearly. Here, there is plenty of room for women to build, create, and grow the kind of structures and institutions that are organic, sustainable, and people-friendly. Eventually, we believe it is margins that define the center, and it is from the margins that real change comes to the center. Let me explain. The birth of Seva was not without labor pains. When Seva went to register as a trade union, the first question of the registrar of unions asked was, who are you fighting against? We said, we are not fighting against anyone. We are fighting for each other. After all, what is a union, I said. It is a coming together, a bonding. But uh, then the registrar said, you are a ragtag bunch. This, uh, this one sells vegetables on the street and that one rolls uh, cigarettes at home. Some are from the city, and some are villagers. Some are city people by day, uh, and villagers by night. And these village women don't stick to one trade. They make, they make baskets and do embroidery and crafts in their homes, but as soon as the rains come, they run to the fields and become agriculture workers. You call that work and call them workers? The registrar asked me. The day Seva was ultimately registered as a trade union, we had already called into question the very definition of what is work and who is a worker. We believe that work, like life, defies categories. Whoever contributes to the economy, whether from home, from the street, or an official workplace, is engaged in work and is a worker. There are as many professions as there is work needed to sustain life. Again, when the women tried to get small loans from regular banks to get out of the clutches of money lenders, or to buy their tools of trade, the banks turned their noses up. The women had no assets, no savings, and they could not read nor write, let alone sign their names. Some women had no last names, and their home addresses were so vague. The third shade from the municipal water tap in Rakhiar, or behind the periphery wall of Manek Chok textile mill, that was their address. Well, the slums have no formal addresses. But ask any slum dweller, and everyone knows who lives where. But the banks would 
have none of it. So in 1974, just two years after the trade union seva was registered, the women said, we are poor but so many. Why not we start our own bank? So with 10 rupees a share, we started a cooperative bank. You see, once a woman knows what she wants, she is not afraid to take risks. If we cannot break through, we just find a way around. Today in India, Seva has 1,300,000 women and it is growing. We have come together to form a union to stop economic exploitation. We have formed our own bank to build assets, to save, to borrow, to improve the material quality of life. We have built trade cooperatives of women farmers, craft workers, artisans, and a trade facilitation network connecting local and global markets. We have built a social security network for our maternity needs, health, and life insurance. At our Seva Academy, not being able to read or write uh, does not stop the women from conducting research or learning new skills or exchanging ideas. We have sister sevas in South Africa, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Nepal. Despite being the largest single union in the uh, country today, we are still in the margins. Trade unions uh, disapprove of our comprehensive approach. They believe uh, that all these cooperatives and constructive activities are for NGOs. They have no place in proper union. But more important, they are reluctant to acknowledge workers from the informal sector. But I ask, who will represent the millions of home-based workers across the globe? And, and the peace rate workers, the street vendors, their numbers are growing in every country, but there is no one to represent them. You may remember the incident that sparked the Arab Spring. It was a Tunisian street vendor who set himself on fire to draw attention to his plight. Who speaks for these millions who have no voice in how economic, political, or social decisions affect their lives? Trade unions are, though, however, trade unions are slowly beginning to realize the role informal sector workers will play in their future. Many feminists are not always happy with us either. We do not take up purely gender issues. We have no units to fight domestic violence. And as such, we do not denounce parda among Muslim women. In my experience, when women have support from other women, and when they have income of their own, they are able to fight their own battles in their own way. For that, economic freedom is the key. When Famidabi, a Muslim BD roller from Bhopal, gathered all her courage to join her Seva sisters in a rally to demand higher peace rates from her dealer, she was already feeling very brave. She had never stepped out of her home without her burqa. So naturally, she wore her burqa to the rally. Her daughter-in-law laughed and said, Look at Kala, off to make revolution with her burqa on. These words pierced Famidabi's heart. Her burqa did not come off overnight, but under that burqa, she was quietly changing. By the time she cast it aside, she was already a different woman. Strong, resilient, and an inspiration to others in her community. Famidabi would eventually become the president of Seva Bhopal. Change comes from within. It cannot be imposed 
or it cannot be given. Seva works with women in Afghanistan. We bring employment to women in war-torn Kabul who are confined to their homes. They earn a living by growing and processing almonds and pine nuts. When the women's earnings bring food into the home, buy books for the children and bicycles for the husbands, a silent transformation begins. The husband that refused to let his wife to go to her cooperative to work he is now seen bringing hot lunch to her at work. When the women come for training in financial literacy, we noticed that several husbands were waiting by the door pretending they had something important to tell their wives. <laughs> then we realized that the men are in fact trying to catch every word of the lecture on when to use credit and when to use savings. So you see, men do not, men also do not have it that easy either. Women know that productive work is the thread that weaves a society together. When you have work, you have an incentive to maintain a stable society. Life then is no longer just about survival, but about improving the present and investing in a better future. Work builds peace because work gives people roots. It builds communities and it gives meaning and dignity to one's life. It is time we connected the dots between union, work, and peace. In my experience, women are the key to building a holistic community. Women's participation and representation is an integral part of the development process. But for that, women themselves must be willing to recognize their own strengths and build on them. It is not enough to lament over their vulnerability. We cannot find solutions using the same logic that created these problems in the first place. For a world that is struggling with imbalances of overproduction, pollution, unemployment, and exploitation, perhaps we can look for some answers from the poor women of the developing world. Despite the burdens of poverty and injustice, look at the dignity with which the women in the margins find creative and sustainable solutions to, life, to live better lives. Poverty cannot be removed without empowerment, without restoring balance, without looking after the well-being of the worker, but also her family, her community, her work environment, and the world we all live in. And women are already doing it. We, women, need to remind the world and ourselves that political freedom cannot be fully realized without economic freedom. Political freedom is only a shadow of economic freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Ilabat, for teaching us and inspiring us. And thank you all for joining us today.